In this video, I'm going to explain central bank digital currencies. There is a tidal wave of CBDCs coming and a couple that are already here. And this will fundamentally change our global monetary system and it's going to affect everyone in the world. Make sure you watch until the end as I've got a little surprise for you that involves me with long hair, a missing tooth, and a Chinese game show. Welcome to DeFi Now. I'm Josh Cross here with our DeFi dog, Steve Irwin. Irwin, fist bump. Fist bump. There you go. Good boy. Such a good dog. First off, thank you so much for choosing this video. And if you'd be so kind as to help me out with the uh, YouTube algorithm, with the likes and subscribes, I would super appreciate that. And remember that I'm no financial advisor and this is just current events in my opinion. Now let's go. I know, I know. Most of the money we use is already digital. That's why it seems like this isn't a big change. We already do 99% of transactions without cash. I look at my bank account and I spend money digitally. I transfer money on Venmo digitally. I pay my bills digitally. Here's the difference. Actually, actually there are a few important differences. First, the money in your bank account or Venmo or wherever else you store it, it isn't money at all. It's just a record of how much your bank or PayPal owes you. Say you loaned three friends or family members some money. Altogether, you've lent out $800. Now you keep a record of how much each of them owe you on your note-taking app in your smartphone. So you can see that this $800 is yours, right? Hopefully they'll pay you back, but until they do, you don't own that $800. It's just accounts receivable. The same is true for your bank account. You deposit your money, which means you're loaning it to the bank. That money now legally belongs to the bank and that's what they owe you. Your bank account, in principle, is no different than the record of $800 on your phone. The only way for you to truly own US dollars is to have it in cash. Any other form of it is just debt. A central bank digital currency though is fundamentally different. It is cash, but it's in digital form. It's not debt like the dollars in our bank accounts, which is great, right? You'll have a bank account directly with the central bank with actual money in it. The IMF is largely selling this as a solution to cross-border payments. If you've ever sent any international bank transfer or use services like Western Union, PayPal, you know how that it's slow, it's expensive, and it's opaque and it is in need of change. And I've discussed it in an earlier video, which you can find over there. But these central bank digital currencies go so far beyond cross-border payments. CBDCs will allow central banks to program money in a way they couldn't before. As I said, some will work in direct contact with consumers, others they'll distribute through, through the commercial banks so that they don't become totally irrelevant, and others will do a mixture of both. The main points I want to get here is that this will change everything. It's going to be incredibly positive and it's going to be incredibly negative. Central bank digital currencies will give the central banks of the world new power over the currencies. They can program them any way that they want. They can give a college student a higher interest rate on savings while at the same time giving a negative interest rate to the baby boomer who has a lot of savings. They will adjust the economy from the macro to the individual levels and they can do it in real time. They will certainly experiment with this in ways that wasn't possible before. This will revolutionize the way taxes are collected, which will likely be done in real time, so no more IRS. They can use the new system to distribute universal basic income, which will probably be needed as more and more people lose their economic usefulness. They will use big data and behavioral economics to incentivize behaviors that they want from the populace. It's the ultimate centrally planned economy, and to me, it definitely leans a lot more Orwellian than utopian. Here in the US, the Secretary of the Treasury, Steve Mnuchin, and head of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, have been urging policymakers to sign another stimulus bill. But due to the political standoff and incentives, neither party is willing to do so. Depending on how the election goes, it could be spring before we get any more stimulus, if at all. But the US is still in an enviable position because at least we have the ability to print and distribute stimulus money. Most governments don't have this luxury. Either they flat out cannot, like countries in Europe who are under the European Central Bank, or they'd risk hyperinflation in the case of smaller countries with their own currencies. This is what happened in Germany after World War I. They had to pay war reparations to the Allies, which they did by printing money, buying foreign currency, and making payments with that. The strategy worked until their currency had no international value, and France French and Belgian troops invaded and occupied the, the Ruhr Valley to take goods such as coal instead. 
In protest of the occupation, the German government ordered the workers to lay down their tools and do nothing and they would still pay them a salary by printing money. They had almost zero production and insane amounts of money printing to fund this policy. Because of this, there was not enough goods to go around, but there was enough money. A loaf of bread in Berlin was around 160 marks in, in late 1922, and one year later it cost 200 billion marks. 160 to 200 billion in just a year. Just think about that. Let's say a loaf of bread today is about $3.50, then Halloween of next year it costs about $4.3 million. Now I bring up Germany and the, and the Weimar Republic because it's one of the most famous examples of hyperinflation. There were many reasons why money printing debased the currency so quickly, but in order for this to happen on such a scale and at this speed, there has to be a way for real value to exit the country. If only one country prints the money like this, the money flows into other countries. But what if every central bank in the world agrees to print money together? This is what the IMF is pushing towards. They have all this talk of cross-border payments and the brotherhood and sisterhood of humanity, but beneath all of that fluff, the real change here is that if central banks combine their forces and they print together, they can greatly increase the amount that they can print without debasing their individual currencies compared to each other. But this will mean that all of these fiat currencies will still go to zero as they always do compared to hard assets. Now which countries are doing it first? The world's first central bank digital currency was officially rolled out on October 20th in the Bahamas. The Bahamian sand dollar started testing in part of the country in 2019, and after a successful pilot, it's now officially rolled out. It can be used at any merchant who has a central bank approved e-wallet on their mobile device. Now, interestingly, it's pegged to the US dollar, so in a way, it's like a beta version for the digital dollar that will come out eventually. But the Federal Reserve has stated that they are in no hurry, which makes sense because we want to hold on to our role as reserve currency as long as possible. And not to be outdone, Cambodia just released their own digital currency. The new system called Bakong was announced by Chia Sare, the director of the National Bank of Cambodia on October 28th, and is said to work seamlessly with Cambodia's existing financial infrastructure. And with their app, anyone with a Cambodian phone number and bank account can now store the digital riel or US dollars in their wallet and make mobile payments. And by the time this video goes out, there might even be more digital currencies rolled out. China has been testing theirs in several cities and they just had a, like a $1.5 million lottery in the tech city of Shenzhen in early October to encourage the use of it as they plan to launch it na nationwide. And this is, this is only the start of the exponential growth of central bank digital currencies. They're all going digital. And now the IMF, the BIS, the FSB and other powerful acronyms are pushing this faster and faster. Here's the situation. We have a small group of individuals at the International Monetary Fund, the Bank of International Settlements, the Financial Stability Board, and central banks who determine global monetary policy, and now fiscal policy. They are not elected and not accountable for their actions or repercussions for their actions. They can create money while the rest of the world has to work for it. As if this doesn't give them enough power, they're now pushing to switch to digital only versions of currencies so they can centrally plan the entire global economy, choose who gets more money and who gets less money, and they can see every single transaction anyone makes. There won't be any financial privacy within the system. Make no mistake, this is the biggest news of the year. This is bigger than everything else that has happened in 2020. This will change what money is for decades to come. This will change the way in which we value everything in the world. Last time this happened was 70 years ago. And it's gonna happen with the majority of people being oblivious to it. They're just gonna be like, oh, it's nice, it's better payments. These digital currencies and the regulators behind them will redefine global money and everything it touches. And it touches everything. Fortunately, we're not all screwed because we have a safe haven from this. We have a way to exit that system or at least only use it in certain aspects of our lives. As Raoul Pal said, we have a life raft, so we'll stay afloat during these cataclysmic changes. We have Bitcoin, we have DeFi, we have crypto. I would definitely steer clear of USD Tether though, as unregulated stable coins will not be tolerated in this new system. 
At this point, it's irresponsible not to own at least some Bitcoin. So I challenge you to let at least one other person know about it this week. You may not convince them, but you'll plant a seed and they deserve to know. Now, if you have any questions or comments on anything I've said here, make sure your voice is heard in the comments below. I will reply to all of them. Before we go, we hit 500 subs on the 20th, and as you know if you've been watching my channel for a while, that means I gotta open another four bottles of my DeFi Now quarantine mead. Unfortunately, I don't have footage of me opening it this time, but just know that they were good and I didn't drink them all myself. On a more serious note, I really want to show my appreciation for all your support. The growth we've seen on this channel has been absolutely tremendous. I know that your time is your most valuable resource and I'm really grateful that you're spending some of it here. It took us four months to hit 100 subscribers, two more months to get to 500, but I need your help getting to 1,000. When we do, I've got a very special treat to share. I gave you a hint in the beginning of the video, but I've got some pretty awesome footage from my time in China that needs to be shared. I'll tell you more about it in next week's video when we dig deeper into the adoption of cryptocurrencies. Now, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss it. Till next time, thank you so much for watching, take care, and stay educated.